So this morning, no shock, we're going back to the Gospel of John. I know you're like surprised. We're going to John chapter 12. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. I do have the page number in the pew Bible in front of you. If you didn't bring a Bible, you don't have it on your phone, we have them in front of you. You can open up there in the Gospel of John. And we're going to be looking at a passage this morning that if you're a church-going person, this passage is going to be pretty familiar to you because it's usually one of the passages that we use on Palm Sunday. The heading in your Bible might be triumphal entry. And this is the passage in which Jesus records when Jesus comes in to Jerusalem. Often on Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday is celebrated right before Easter, so it's that Sunday beforehand. We love having the kids down, waving palms, and we do, you know, like a song like Rob did this morning, Hosanna, some songs like that. And the church celebrates it. Well, this, of course, is not Palm Sunday, but as we're going through the text, it is our next text up, and so we're going to talk about it. And I want to remind us what John's purpose is in this book. I think we've talked about it once or twice, okay? This is John chapter 20, verse 31, okay? So why do I keep talking about it? Because I talk about this verse because this is the Holy Spirit, and John, the apostle's aim, is to reveal Christ to us. So every passage we look at, in particular in the Gospel of John, but I want you to do this throughout the Scripture, we want to be asking the question, what does this show me about the identity of Jesus? What does this show me about who he is? And so we've been looking through the Gospel of John through this lens, okay? So that these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, which is right here on the back, okay? That's the point. And so John, in his um, being illuminated and guided by the Holy Spirit, brings passages, brings events, brings teachings and interactions of Jesus to the surface, bringing them together, So that we, the readers, those who are listening, could truly understand who Jesus is and who he is, how that impacts us, okay? What that means for us. So it's personal and it's corporate for the world and yet for us as individuals. And so I want us to Um, Again, view this passage in and with that lens so that you'll gain understanding again about who Christ is and then again what that means for us. And if you have not made a decision to believe in that Jesus is the Christ, I pray that today would be that time that you say, I believe based upon what the word says says to me, right? And so that's why I want you to look in your Bible. That's what I'm asking you to study and consider because Jesus made audacious claims, claiming to be the light of the world, claiming to be the very Son of God, claiming to be the gate and the truth and the life and promising eternal life. This is significant because collectively (laughs) we each have an enemy. Well, we have several, (laughs) but one that we share is death, by the way. Death comes to us all. And what happens next, Christ talks about. We also have an issue (laughs) That we have a greater God, as Scripture tells us, and we can see in creation from the majesty of mountains to the, the delightfulness of butterflies, right? The complexities of our body, how we have a planet that is perfectly fine-tuned for us. We have a shared issue where we have a perfect loving, 
holy, righteous, powerful creator God who delights to be in relationship with us and asks us to be in relationship with him, <laughs> we decided that we'd rather do life on our own, right? All have, and here's the word, sinned, right? God tells us, don't do that, and that's the very thing we do, right? Myself included. But God and his son gave to us what he requires of us. Righteousness, perfection. And receive that through the son who died, took the punishment on us. Said that we may become the righteousness of God. And if you're in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Even though you don't feel like it at times, you don't think, surely this can't be true. It is true because of what Christ did. And you are found in him. To all who believes, he gives life in his name. So anyone's identity that you need to figure out, you need to figure out your own for sure, okay? You need to know who Jesus is. It, was he just a moral teacher? Was he was a, a person who was just a loony, right? Because what he claimed is significant. Or is what he said true about himself, which brings great weight and substance to what he said, proved in, of course, what he did, as we see in the Gospels and in the Scriptures, and, of course, in his resurrection, his ascension, and his promise that he will be coming back again to make all things new. I think we know in our heart that things how it is now, it just isn't all right, right? When kids are, are murdered or prematurely deceived, when there is um, lying and um, relational discord, when there's break-ins, when there's violence, when there's even diseases that take out our spouse early. We know in our heart, we long, saying this isn't the way it should be. And you're right. It's not the way that it was designed, but it's going to be the way that God remakes all things new for eternity. And you and I can be a part of that because of Christ Jesus. He is the righteousness of God. He is the holiness of God. He is the word of God made incarnate. As John tells us in the opening lines of this glorious gospel, which if you haven't read it for a while, read it, chapter 1. It's magnificent. It is mysterious. It is profound. It is life-changing. And his Holy Spirit comes in our hearts when we believe as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. This is our Christ. And this is who John proclaims to us. And so again, thinking about and turning to our passage, Jesus now has been ministering for some time. Came on the scene, he drew disciples to himself, he performed astounding miracles. And the latest one that took place according to the Gospel of John is the raising of his friend Lazarus who had been in the grave and thoroughly dead for four days. He heard Jesus' voice and came to life again. Now, the Jews at that time and those who knew about him, they were divided. They, because of the Old Testament scriptures, anticipated the Messiah coming, the Deliverer to come. And they longed for it as they were under the oppression of an uh, occupying force, the Romans. 
And they were looking to various people and looking for signs pointing to the long-awaited Messiah. And they asked, is this, could this be the one? Now before Jesus started to minister, there was another guy named John the Baptist or the baptizer. And people wondered, well, perhaps John is the one. And John said, hmm, no, 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 I'm not the one, but the one who comes after me, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Look to him. And Jesus then came on the scene at God's sovereign timing and ministered, did miracles, spoke with authority the words of God. And so we've been following the story in the Gospel of John as we are journeying through. And if you, again, haven't been, us, been here for a while or you, this is your first time, I encourage you to read it. Just read and look, who is this Jesus? And the people then were trying to determine this, where some firmly believed that this indeed is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Right? Whereas others were still debating and where the religious leaders now became, most of them, the majority of them, super opposed to Jesus because they were scared that Jesus would take away their power or their popularity or their possessions. They were opposing him because they wanted, as we read last week, their position and their religion, and they wanted the Jewish heritage greater than the glory of God. And so in Jerusalem, uh, at this time, when we're going to read this, an event called, or a festival called the Passover was happening. And if you're, again, familiar with your scripture, this is seen in the book of Exodus. This is Moses bringing God's people, the Hebrews, out of bondage in Egypt into the promise that God has given them with signs and plagues, and the last one being the angel of death coming to extinguish the firstborn sons. Moses proclaimed to the Israelites that in order for this angel to pass over their house, there needed to be a substitute, a spotless lamb, by the way, which pointed to Christ, ultimately. That they were to find this lamb, and it was his life or its life forfeited for our life. And they were to take some of the blood and to sprinkle it over the doorposts of their house. And so when this judgment came, it would pass over that house. And so the people of God, the Hebrews, the Israelites, were told to celebrate this festival year after year after year in recognition of what God had done and in anticipation to what God would do ultimately in the Messiah. And so it was during that very week in pre preparation for the Passover where the primary city in Jerusalem, excuse me, in Israel, named Jerusalem, was there, the, the temple, and people had gathered from all corners of the country. The city was full of people, and then there was this anticipation, will Jesus show up? Will he perform a miracle? Have you heard about the raising of Lazarus? And people were putting their trust in him. Would he come? Will he show himself? Will he ascend the throne and take control? Or would the authorities arrest him? And they had decided, as we read previously, that they were going to kill him, and not just him, Lazarus as well. Because of his testimony, people were believing in Christ. So there was this angst, there was this anticipation, there were these conversations, there were the 
looking, there was wondering, have you heard anything? Is he going to be here? What's going to happen? What's going on? And into that setting comes Jesus. And he comes to the city in a very particular, peculiar way. And so we're going to read about that. And we're going to look at a couple passages that are quoted in our passage today from the Old Testament. Psalm 118 and what was read here, Zechariah 9. It'll make sense to us and we'll see things about Christ that as he comes in to the city in this manner, what he's communicating and what that means. So again, go to your Bible, Pew Bible, it's page 925 if you're looking for it. That's it. And we're going to pick up the continued story in chapter 12, starting with verse 12. John 12, chapter, excuse me, verse 12. And by the way, there are notes if that would be helpful to you in the back, or you can grab them afterwards. Or download them on your phone right now. You can do that as well. So here we go. The next day, the great crowd that had come from the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. Now at first, His disciples, and these were those who were closely following him, who had been with him for almost three years at this point, around three years. Now, at first, those disciples, they didn't didn't get it. (laughs) They didn't understand the significance of this. At first, it was lost on them. But only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Okay, we're going to pause right there. Okay, so even his disciples who had been with him for some time didn't fully comprehend what was taking or what took place. And they realize that these things that happened, namely what is quoted in this passage, these things that happened because it was written about him. So in order for us to understand what was written, we then have to go back to the places in which these quotes were originally put down. So that we then can understand what these things meant and that those passages were indeed written about them. So this first one, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel, as the people were saying this. It's a direct quote from Psalm 118. So again, go in your Bible or your phone or whatever you have. We're going to take a a deep dive-ish into Psalm 118 so that we understand what this is saying and how this relates to Christ and then how it relates to us. Now, Psalm 18 is what is called or referred to a messianic psalm. The psalm that talks about and proclaims and prophesies what's going to happen in the future about the Messiah. The whole song and the whole psalm is about that. 
And Scripture now tells us that that psalm, written hundreds of years previous, was written to describe Christ. And in this psalm, it starts out in verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. You will not outlive God's love, even in eternity. His love endures forever. The psalmist spoke of this as he delights to talk about God's love. And you can read the first four verses and then he describes in this passage, it's a wonderful psalm, right? Read it. Perhaps you need to meditate on it this week. I hope you do, right? He then describes how the Lord helped move this person from a tight place to a spacious one. From being afraid to being triumphant. From being a victim to being a victor. From being attacked and consumed to being saved because the Lord is their strength. I want you to read this psalm in light of Jesus. And it goes on to get very specific about this Savior, the Lord. It continues to say that this Lord is the gate. Does that sound familiar? Right? Jesus called himself the gate. So this Lord is the gate through which the righteous may enter the kingdom of God. Right? Jesus said he was the gate. It goes on to say that this Lord is the stone the builders rejected. And that stone has become the corner stone. The builders being the priests and those who were, quote unquote, building the house of God, they rejected Jesus. But Jesus was not a rejected stone. He indeed was the cornerstone in which the whole structure was built upon. And we are living stones built into God's house. And this talks about him hundreds of years beforehand. Saying the Lord has done this and it's marvelous marvelous in our eyes and then the psalm ends with these words this is psalm 118 verse 25 lord this is where the quote comes in save us lord grant us success by the way, this is where the word Hosanna comes from, which literally means save, please, and came to mean at this time, hooray for salvation. Right? It's coming, it's here, salvation, salvation. So they say Hosanna, which is a paraphrase of sorts that says Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. And salvation is here. Hosanna. This is our salvation. And then verse 26, these people were saying this in a massive parade. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. And they were saying this with palm branches, <laughs> waving in the air. They were enacting and fulfilling and applying 
this whole psalm to Jesus. And check out what the next verse says. Verse 27 of Psalm 118. The Lord is God. This was a statement of his divinity. He was fulfilling this psalm, and in this very psalm, if people were paying attention, it declares the Lord is God, and he was the Lord, so therefore he is God. Do you catch this? This is significant. And it goes on, and this is marvelous indeed. And he, which is Christ, has made his light shine on us. Those who cried out to him for salvation, those who are in darkness, he's made his light shine on us regardless of who we are or where we are or what we've done when we cry to the Lord in our distress, in our tight place in our bondage, in our sin, if we cry to him for salvation, the Lord's light shines on us, pierces the darkness and illuminates our life. With bows or bows, excuse me, in hands, joined in the festal procession, that is the grand parade, join in up to the horns of the altar. So this is my first point. Half an hour of introduction. I will get done on time. Maybe. I'm like, yeah, Splinter, you say that all the time. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> Jesus is God. This is the first point. And we are children of the light. The Lord is God. Jesus is the Lord. He is God. This was being proclaimed right there. He is the light of the world. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Right? Jesus proclaimed that. And his light has pierced our darkness and shined on us. And those who call out to the Lord in their darkness, their distress, he will shine his light on you and deliver you and strengthen you and lift you up in salvation. That is good news. No one is ever left without hope because of Christ. He can hear any voice at any place, in any condition, for any reason. You call out to him. Lord, save me. His light shines on us. Makes us new. Changes our identity from lost to found, from a child of disobedience to a child of obedience, from a child of darkness to a child of light. And we walk in the light in this imagery John uses all throughout the Gospel of John. And if you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it's near the back of the New Testament. Written by the same author, John, who uses this imagery all the time about light. And walking in it and living through it. In the book of Revelation, again written by John the Apostle, he uses the same imagery that indeed Christ is the light of the world. And those who follow after him carry that light 
and our children are born. That's good news for us. And so this great crowd, as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, said these words with palm branches, as was prophesied would happen. Jesus was stating in this prophetic movement that he was God. And by the way, notice where this... <laughs> oh, this right now, where this um, <laughs> was a victory ce celebration procession was actually a funeral procession. Leading to the horns of the altar. Did you notice that? Horns of the altar, by the way, was a place where the sacrifice or the Passover lambs to be. This is where Jesus and this parade was heading, unbeknownst to some in this crowd. This is how the king was going to set his people free by becoming the Passover lamb and rising again. The good news is that, again, in this passage, we see that Jesus is indeed God and that those who are in him have become children of light. Gives us hope, call out to him, praise him. And the psalm um, ends in a beautiful and rightly fitting way with praise. We'll read verse 28. The psalmist says, you are my God. I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You are secure, my friends, in the love and the light of Christ when you believe in him. He's not a God, he is my God. He's not amongst the gods, he is the God. My God, and I will praise and exalt him because his love is limitless. This coming into the city at this point was meaningful, intentional, specific, communicating the identity of the one in whom they were praising Hosanna. And that psalm is connected to another prophecy. This is why Jesus found a donkey. Matthew says, he says, hey, guys, go get this donkey, this type of thing. Like, what is that about, right? So it was like, Jesus tired? He's like, mm, I don't think I can make it, boys. Go find me some transportation. Right? Well, what was this? Was Jesus like trying to show off a little bit? You all walk, well, I'm going in in style, boys. By the way, the next time he comes back, he doesn't come back on a donkey, he comes back on a horse. A whole different thing. You can read in the book of Revelation what that looks like. Chapter 19, in a split second. That's right, Tom, I heard you. I heard you. So what's this donkey all about? <laughs> That's kind of weird. I think it's kind of weird. What was that? Hmm. Well, let's now turn to this second passage, Zechariah. <laughs> like Zechariah, that's a book of the Bible. It's the book of the Bible. Yeah. Okay. There you go. It's Old Testament. I have the page number here, but I don't know where it is, so good luck. You're going to have to find it yourself. <laughs> like what? Oh, here it is. <laughs> Just kidding, page 818 in the Pew Bible, if you're looking at that, Zechariah. Prophet, this is actually a very profound book, by the way. Maybe someone should preach on this book sometime. That'd be a good idea. So the second thing, 
Okay? The second quote, the quote is, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, which was Jerusalem. Jerusalem was called Zion. See, your king is coming. Seated on a donkey's colt. Okay? So what is this all about? If this was written Jesus, then we have to go and look at it. By the way, I want you to read the Bible this way. Okay. Number one, you are reading your Bibles, right? Yes, Pastor, I'm reading my Bible. Okay. Read your Bible. I, we've talked about that, right? We've talked about that before? Okay. Read it. More importantly, have it read you. Okay. God, what are you saying to me today? And if you see an Old Testament passage, don't just skip it over, look it up. Our electronic Bibles are super helpful that way. Often they just have links. All you have to do is click, investigate, slow down a little bit sometimes. That's what we're doing today. So what, what is this about? So here we are. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly. Here it is. Daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king, your king, comes to you righteous. And there was no one who was righteous like Jesus. Purely righteous he's coming to you righteous and victorious humbly lowly riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey decades millennia before it was fulfilled in Christ, this was written by the Spirit of God. So when Jesus said, hey guys, go get a donkey. I got a young one, a colt, never been ridden. Matthew talks more of the details. I must ride into the city on it. Christ in this prophetic act of identity was identifying to the one in which this prophecy was written. It was written about him. This Zechariah passage and we're going to read some more of it. But it continues to say, this king, this king, the king who rides into the city in this procession on a colt, on a donkey, a young donkey. This one will proclaim peace to the nations. And he will rule to the ends of the earth. And this peace, check this out, will be established by the blood of his covenant. He, as Peter read for us from this passage, will free the prisoners. He said of a waterless, waterless pit was a, um, uh, a term, an image for hell. Will, will save the prisoners of hell and they are to be in his care, and they become now prisoners of hope. Do you like that? Prisoners of hope until he comes again to restore both heaven and earth back to them. This is what Jesus was referring to in riding into the city on a donkey. All of this stuff. And this passage continues and is connected and concludes this way, Zechariah 9, 16. Here it is again. The Lord there, what's the word? God. 
declaring again his identity. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. Does that sound familiar? I am the good shepherd. Not by coincidence, folks. He will save like a shepherd saves his flock. They, those who are saved, I love this imagery, (laughs) will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine, the young women. This is my next point. Jesus is God, and we are jewels in his crown. One of the metaphors used for the people, the children of God, the one we often hear is that we're sheep, which is no compliment Indeed, in some ways, we are surely like sheep. But you're also a jewel in his crown. Sparkle with the glory of Christ. And in him, all you all are very attractive. Talking about the imagery of Christ in us. Talking about when the new heaven and new earth is restored. Now you twinkle, then you're going to shine. So Jesus being God and us calling to him. And us being saved, hearing his voice like a sheep to a shepherd. God then makes us as a fine jewel sparkling in his crown. Do you see yourself that way? You probably don't. Besides Lenny. He has a very powerful (laughs) self-esteem. You punk. God makes us new. He shines in us. Take that. Know that. You're precious to Christ. Precious to Him. Stop trying to be precious to somebody or something. You're already precious to God. Someone needs to hear that today. I don't know who it is. Don't live your life trying to be loved. You are already loved. More thoroughly and fully. You cannot be loved anymore. You're beautiful calls you beautiful, so therefore you are. Those who believe. Jesus is God, and we are the jewels of his crown. So when Jesus entered into the city at this time in his ministry, this is a entering into the week, we call it the Passion Week, if you're familiar with Christianity. The rest of the Gospel of John deals with that, and then a little bit after what he's saying is significant. Don't be, don't miss the details. He's God. All four of the Gospels record this event, saying this is important for everyone everywhere to understand. Him coming into Jerusalem this way speaks volumes to who he is and matters for us. 
And our passage for today ends and it connects to the next passage. We're going to get to it next week. These things are going to come to the surface. We'll see the Greeks coming to him. We'll see him, Jesus talking about being glorified. We'll see him talking about light. All of these things tumble into what he says. They're all connected. The verse 17 of John 12 says this. Now again, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb just a couple miles away in Bethany and raised him from the dead... Those folks that continue to spread the word. Now many people, because they've heard that he had performed this sign, they went out to meet him. Surely this must be the Christ. Verse 19. So the Pharisees, this was the religious rulers at the time, they said another, one another, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Jesus is God. And the whole world has gone after him. Now the Jews at that time thought that the Messiah was only for them. Those who knew their scripture knew differently because the world was impregnated always in God's mind that the gospel was for everyone, everywhere, but the Jews thought it was just for them and they were mistaken. And this Pharisee, unbeknownst to him, was prophesying that the whole world will indeed come after him and surely once they know, they do. And by the way, there are three billion people on this planet currently living as we are breathing air right now. I've never heard the name of Jesus. That's a travesty. Hear me now. I hope that we as a congregation and perhaps you as an individual will say, here I am. Send me. Because this gospel is for you, but it is not about you. And this message must be proclaimed. Proclaimed by what is made in general revelation, that's what we call it, through the stars and the streams and the mountains and the bees, but specifically that people will know the name of Jesus. Again, we'll see next week, and you can just read down the next verse, says the Greeks came to him and they said, Sir, let us see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Your neighbor, while they know it or not, they in their heart, they need to see Jesus. Jesus is indeed God. Because of who he is, what he's done, what he continues to do, the message of Christ, his story, how it's impacted your life, the lives of millions, if not billions of people, matters. And it's for everyone, everywhere, again, including your Mother-in-law. <laughs> Some of y'all are great mother-in-laws. Some of y'all might have some work to do. I'm just joking with you. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. Regardless of location. 
regardless of language, regardless of skin color, regardless of education, for everyone. So we are going to conclude, and we're going to conclude with a song. Thank you, Rob, from uh, the quote Psalm 118. And I'm not sure where you're at today. You may have not made a decision to follow Christ. Hope you've fallen in love with him. More than just knowing some things about him, that you indeed fall in love with him. He is the good shepherd. He is the gate. He is the light. He is the bread of life. He's your faithful friend. His promises are so sure, and he is our hope. I hope you love him more than the people you sit next to and they're great people. I hope you love him more than any team or anything. Because he's worthy of your praise. I hope you know that you are jewel to him. I hope you know if you call to him, he will answer. His light will shine upon you. He was saying this by just coming into the city. And I hope that you will continue to bear witness of him. There's people across your street that don't know Christ. I've been praying for our neighborhood for years. Talking to our neighbors. And perhaps you say, wait a second, I want to know more about these three billion people who haven't heard. I hope that's you. I hope we send to you. And maybe God will put that on your heart. I don't know. I don't know. So before we sing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you. Pray for me. Pray for us with song and you say hey you know what I, I need to spend some time with the Lord or I need someone to pray with me there'll be some folks right here if you just want to come down here if you want to come down here and pray do it <laughs> well it's going to be weird we're all weird okay it's really great just do it Let's pray together right now. So Jesus, what a profound thing that we read about today. What a profound passage. You said so much by saying literally nothing in this passage. You said volumes because scripture spoke for you. Your actions spoke for you. say with the psalmist blessed be the name of the Lord the Lord is good his love endures forever God I pray for us my friends have, have heard me and us pray already today that we would hear your voice God I trust that happened or will happen in the next moments, God. I don't know. Help us to see the truth of who you are. What it means for us to call upon you. What you call us and how you send us and how you love us. May we all know this. Continue to speak. Your servants are listening draw people to yourself even this day, God. We give you great praise and great honor.